Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Ernie Chambers, representing the 11th Legislative District in Omaha. I owe an apology to the people who came to speak on this bill. Early on, I had mentioned that the bill would be heard on today's date because it is a sort of a lobby day for those who are opposed to the death penalty. I had given the impression, it was mine at the time, that this would be the only bill that would be scheduled. There are people who could not stay as long as that other hearing went, and they left. I cannot blame them. The fault is mine. I should have been more attentive to how the scheduling was being done, and I could have objected to it at that time. But I was not attentive. I blundered. I apologize not only to those people who left, but to those who stayed here all of this time. The bill is too important, not just because it's mine, to have been handled in the way that it was. And I will learn from this because I am a fast learner. But as I've said on the floor, when I speak forcefully because I believe something is a certain way, I will be just as forceful in acknowledging the error, the blunder on my part. And I'm not going to say a mistake. That I don't want to soft pedal it. Everything is serious. People have things to do with their time. But I'll tell you what I do intend to do. Cut considerably the amount of time I would have taken with an opening. I will stay here and close. And the people who want to testify will have an opportunity to leave if they choose to and not stay an extra amount of time. Because everything that's said is recorded and transcribed, I hope nobody will be deterred from saying what they feel ought to be said. It is a matter of record. The handouts I prepared for the committee, I'm not going to hand out. I'm confident the bill will be advanced from committee. I don't think that's overconfidence. And at the time that I present the bill on the floor, the members of this committee won't have to look at the same handouts twice. And I have prioritized this bill. I'm going to go through my statement of intent for the sake of the record, but it won't be lengthy. Legislative Bill 268 replaces the death penalty with a sentence of life without possibility of parole. Section 1 presents findings that enumerate problems in carrying out judicial executions. Section 20 leaves undisturbed the discretion of the sentencing court to order payment of restitution. And Section 25 retains aggravating and mitigating circumstances by which the sentence is determined. In Section 21, as the bill is drafted, there is a statement that in those, I'm paraphrasing, in those cases where a death sentence was pronounced but it hadn't been carried out, that sentence would be changed to life in prison, imprisonment without possibility of parole. We all know that the only entity in this state which can mitigate or soften a sentence is the, is the pardons board. Because that was stated as a fact, not a fact, but as something that should be done, I would not want, if this bill is ever challenged, should it become law, the argument be made that the legislature counted on these pending death sentences being converted to life imprisonment as a basis for passing the bill. And if that were struck down as an unconstitutional usurpation of judicial authority, then I, it wouldn't make sense. So there's an amendment that would say it is the intent of the legislature so that it's clear that we are expressing to the court that we would intend that those sentences be changed to life imprisonment without parole. Now the court cannot order the legislature to spend money a certain way when we have the discretion to do so. If they cannot, in the Attorney General's office, 
obtain the means to carry out an execution while a death penalty is on the books, we need not make provision to carry out an execution should we pass a bill abolishing the death penalty. That was a digression, Now I will, and I thought I should explain that. I'll go back to this statement. In addition to its negative propensity to diminish the value of human life, the death penalty exerted a degrading, corrupting impact on the office of the Nebraska Attorney General, which disingenuously prevailed on the Nebraska Supreme Court to issue a death warrant setting an execution date for inmate Carrie Dean Moore despite knowing no execution be, could be carried out due to the legal unavailability of sodium thiopental, one of the three drugs mandated by law for use in judicial executions, and that remains the fact today. The Attorney General's office deliberately withheld this critical material fact from the Supreme Court which was compelled to withdraw the death warrant and triggered an extraordinary harsh rebuke from the Douglas County District Court in its, dis in its December 11, 2011 order dismissing the post-conviction motion of Moore. I would have gone into more detail on that than I'm going to now, but I will point out that what the district court was saying that the post-conviction relief action is not the instrumentality for seeking sanctions against the Attorney General. Therefore, it couldn't be considered. But this is what that court said anyway. Quote, notwithstanding fairly persuasive proof that the Department of Correctional Services obtained controlled substances of unknown efficacy from a foreign distributor and manufacturer not inspected, registered, or approved by the FDA or DEA, and a lack of transparency and candor, even with the Nebraska Supreme Court and the Douglas County Attorney's Office by the AG's office beginning on January 24, 2011, and such acts require accountability, it is not available through post-conviction relief. The court acknowledged that the Supreme Court had been snookered the county attorney's office had been snookered, and the attorney for Kerry Dean Moore had been snookered. Back to the statement. The inexcusable, unethical ambush of the Supreme Court and Douglas County Attorney's Office by the AG is but another example of the corrupting influence of the death penalty and a substantive reason for its elimination. I am going to go through this little chart that I prepared on the back for the record. This chart deals with the number of executions, the number of death sentences imposed from the date that the first execution was carried out. The total number of people sentenced to death between 1903 and 2010, not the next execution was carried out in 2010, but people are on death row. The total number of people sentenced was 72. The total number executed was 23. Less than one third of those sentenced to die were actually executed. The first method was by hanging, and that period was from 1903 to 1913 the total number hanged was eight. Then electrocution became the method in 1920. So between 1920 and 1997, when the last ex execution was carried out, that was 17 years ago, the total number electrocuted was 15. The number of sentences commuted 31. The number who died from natural causes, three. The number from suicide, two. Furloughed, whatever that meant at the time, one. In 1913, a J. O'Hearn, O apostrophe, capital H-E-A-R-N, one vacated sentence, 
That was in 2001, Jeremy Sheets, and currently there are 11 people on death row. So I'm not advocating for more executions, but if from 1903 until the present, there were only 72 people sentenced to die and only 23 executed, it's clear that this is not a penalty or a punishment that is relied on to do anything. For those who say that it could serve as a deterrent, something so seldom used could not be a deterrent. Something so seldom used on its face was imposed arbitrarily, and the fact that nearly, well not nearly half, 31 were commuted out of 72, that's a high percentage. Something was not like it should be. Now, in terms of the white members of the population, no females, the total number sentenced to death, 48, I meant 40, 49, my specs and the light are conspiring against me. The total number of white persons sentenced to die, 49. <coughs> Five were hanged, 11 were executed for a total of 16. Out of 49 sentenced to die, 16 were actually executed. 22 were committed, five died, three of natural causes, two by suicide, then the one furlough, one vacated, and currently there are four white people on death row. Of black people, the total sentence to die were, was 14. Six were actually executed, three by hanging, three by electrocution. Six of the 14 were commuted, Two black people currently are on death row. Of Hispanics, the total sentence to death, six. One was commuted, five are currently on death row. Native Americans, the total number sentenced to death, three. One was electrocuted, the other two commuted. So this information is attached to the statement of intent, but the statement of intent is not a part of the record that will be transcribed <coughs> unless it's handled in the way that I'm handling it now. And if you just have burning questions that you must ask me now, I will answer, but I would hope that for the reasons I gave, I can keep mine to this. We will allow as much time as possible for those who came to testify. Then I will close and I'll answer any questions relative to anything I've said or left unsaid or anything that occurs during the hearing. Your, Thank you. Your procedure will be adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First proponent. Hi, thank you. My name is Ashley Gage, A-S-H-L-E-Y-G-A-G-E. -E. Um, I want to ask you to please excuse my nervousness. The last time that I was in this situation, I was um, testifying in my father's murder trial. So um, this is a little overwhelming. I didn't expect to um, lose my composure. I'm from Kearney, Nebraska and I'm here to testify in support of LB 268 to repeal the death penalty. I was just a teenager when I found my father murdered. As well as offering my personal testimony, I'm also sharing a signed letter from 25 murder victims' families in Nebraska who also want to see the death penalty replaced by life without the possibility of parole. Regardless of our individual circumstances and even our philosoph philosophical thoughts about the death penalty, we recognize that Nebraska's death penalty fails victims. When a murder takes place, the most important question should not be, what is best for society? Particularly, the most important, excuse me, the, the most important question should not be, what does the offender deserve? The most important question should be, what is best for society? Particularly, what best helps victims' families rebuild their lives after the horrible trauma of murder? The death penalty is not a good answer to this question. 
Nebraska's death penalty causes tremendous unnecessary pain and suffering to murder victims' families. In the effort to prevent innocent people from being executed, the process drags on for years, which delays the healing process for victims trapped in the system. It costs too much, which diverts resources that should instead be invested in much needed victims' services or crime pre prevention programs that have been proven to keep us safer. The death penalty creates an arbitrary and painful distinction between victims who are worthy of the death penalty and the vast majority who are not. And finally, the high profile and controversial nature of capital punishment can create rifts between families when they need each other more than ever. For all these reasons, I feel fortunate that my father's case was not a capital case. Had it been a death case, my family would surely still be going back and forth to court, waiting through appeals and waiting for the court's promised punishment to some way be doled out. I don't believe I would have been able to have the life I've lived, a good life, a life that my daddy would have wanted, if his case had been a capital case. I did not endure the lengthy prep time or the multi-part trial and that is, unique, that is unique to capital cases and then spend years waiting for attorneys and then endure decades of appeals. After my father's killer was sentenced to life imprisonment, I was free to move forward with my life. But as you can tell, you don't really ever move forward from something like that, even after almost 15 years. I have a little more, but uh, please. Yes, go ahead. Um, after my father's killer was sentenced to life imprisonment, I was free to move forward with my life. I pursued my education, um, in part because I didn't have to stay close to the courthouse. I have my PhD now. Nebraska has a choice. We can continue with our broken charade of a death penalty system and continue to keep victims' families trapped in this system of false hopes or we can continue to waste millions of dollars that could be better spent. Or we could replace the death penalty system with life imprisonment, allowing victims' families to leave the courthouse that day, knowing their offender is going to start his punishment immediately and anonymously. Any questions? Thank you very much for your coming and testifying. Further proponent. Good afternoon, Senator Tyler Arnold, Budget District Committee. My name is Gwendolyn Hines. It's G W E N D O L E N. Hines is H I N E S. I'm here um, as a member of the Social Justice Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Um, there, are so, there are several reasons that we're against the death penalty. Perhaps the most important one is that sometimes innocent people are put to death. Since 1970, 150 people on death row have been found innocent and have been set free, which makes one wonder how many innocent people have been killed. Someone has to be guilty beyond a reasonable doubt to be, to be convicted, but the burden of proof must be higher in a death penalty case. It must be beyond any doubt, which is hard to prove. Another reason we're against the death penalty is perhaps the most important factor in determining whether a defendant will receive the death penalty is the quality of representation he or she receives. Also, the race of the victim and the race of the defendant are major factors in who receives the death penalty and who doesn't. The death penalty is not a deterrent, And it costs far more to execute a person than it does to keep him or her in prison for life. In Arkansas, a bill to abolish the death penalty passed the Senate Judiciary Committee. The bill's sponsor, Senator David Burnett, a former prosecutor and judge who at one time both sought and imposed the death penalty, said it's no longer a deterrent. It's a punishment that has actually been broken. It doesn't work and it costs a huge amount of money to try and prosecute those cases. Also, many people feel that the death penalty should be done in a humane way and that often doesn't happen. Um, 
there has been a history of botched executions. In July, 20, July 23rd, 2014 in Arizona, Joseph Wood was lethally injected. Mr. Wood gasped for one hour and 40 minutes before death was pronounced. In April 29, 2014 in Oklahoma, Clayton Lockett was lethally injected. It took an hour to find a usable vein. 10 minutes after the first drug, a sedative was administered. The physician overseeing the process um, announced the inmate was unconscious and therefore ready to receive the other two drugs that would actually kill him. These two drugs were known to cause excruciating pain if the recipient was conscious. However, Lockett was not unconscious, as the doctor said he was. And three minutes after the latter two drugs were administered, Lockett began breathing heavily, writhing in the gurney, clenching his teeth, and straining to lift his head off the pillow. Officials then lowered the blinds to prohibit witnesses from seeing what was going on. And 15 minutes later, the witnesses were told to leave the room. 20 minutes after the first drugs were administered, the director of the Oklahoma Department of Corrections halted the execution and issued a two-week stay for Lockhart and also for his partner in crime, who was also on death row and due to be, to be executed shortly thereafter. Um, Lockhart died 43 minutes later of a heart attack. And since 1985, there have been 39 botched lethal injections. And since 1982, there have been 10 botched lethal electrocutions. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Further proponent. Come on. Come on up here. Hi. My name is Miriam Kelly, M-I-R-I-A-M-K-E-L-L-E. I'm from Beatrice. My family's experience is the perfect example how Nebraska's death penalty fails victims' families. I'm here to testify in, fire, in favor of LB-268. In 1985, my baby brother James was tortured to death and his killer, Michael Ryan, was eventually sent to the death row. I have seen over and over again how Nebraska's death penalty is a false promise to victims. When we sentence someone to death, we sentence the victim's family also. <clears throat> Michael Ryan was sentenced nearly 30 years ago. At that time, my son was in diapers, and now my son has two children of his own, and Michael Ryan still sits on death row. I would give anything to go back in, in time and change the death sentence to life imprisonment. If that had happened, my children would have grown up without seeing their uncle's killer made a celebrity as he slowly worked his way through the court system. If we had been given a sentence with life without the paucity of parole, we could have left the legal system behind 30 years ago and not had our focus of our family energy on our grief and not a never ending quest for justice. The purgatory has not nothing to do with whether or not victims want the death penalty since it's in my family's wish to see, Michael, some in my family wish to see him executed and others don't. When we should be united in our loving memories about Jim, comforting one another, the punishment has caused a rift in our family. I have a sister who sends flowers to Jim's grave every year until she will continue to do so when Michael is executed. My daughter is now desperate to see that the execution and expect she will feel better when it comes. that she could have passed with the justice system started her healing journey 30 years ago. With every passing year, her pain is compounded by the fact that the justice system failed to deliver the justice she was promised. Our case isn't unusual. The death penalty can be shortened because the U.S. Supreme Court can't be shortened because the U.S. Supreme Court has mandated that capital cases can be threatened, uh, can be treated with extreme care, and that makes perfect sense. No one wants to see an innocent person executed but the result is an inevitable hardship on victims' families. Even in the quick executing states like te Texas, victims are forced to wait upward of a decade. What's more, in Nebraska, reversals are common, and meaning, meaning that after a family endures the extra long tri capital trial process, the odds are good that the case is going to be reversed. A family is told that justice should be the death penalty, but ultimately it's not available to them. The systems treat family victims like pawns, only when we end the death penalty in Nebraska will we stop making the painful promises to victims' family like mine. I hope you will end the death penalty this year. 
I hate to think of another family going through what we've been through. Any questions? <clears throat> Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. You don't want to know what this book is? You want to know? Three pages about are about my brother's funeral, and the rest of it is appeals and case of this 30-year-old case for Mr. Ryan. Thank you. Next proponent. My name is Ann Shearer. I'm a retired United Methodist Bishop. I served the Nebraska area from 2004 to 2012 and the Missouri area from 1992 until 2004. Will you spell your last name, please? S-H-E-R-E-R. -E -E Thank you. I come before you today thanking you for your consistent hard work and willingness to deal with the hardest issues in our culture. I also come before you to ask you, please void the death penalty. It is expensive. It costs more than lifetime incarceration. It is inhumane. I'll talk about that again in a moment. It is inequitable. Poor people are the primary targets of the death penalty. It is an ineffective deterrent that has been documented time and again. And mistakes happen. Those also have been thoroughly documented. What I'd like to share with you very briefly is that several years ago when I was the resident bishop in Missouri, I was asked to walk with a man who had been sentenced to the death penalty. I went down to Potosi several times and visited with him and with his wife and his stepchildren. On the night of his incarceration, I was the only person allowed to sit outside the cage. I don't know what we do in Nebraska, but in Missouri, they put a person in a cage for a 48-hour uh, suicide watch so that they can't kill themselves before we do it. Uh, the light is on for 48 hours. They cannot go to sleep. They're allowed nothing, and they can touch no other human being. Because I was clergy, I was allowed to put my hand here, and he could put his hand there. <coughs> he was not a nice man. He had a terrible background, and he had hurt innumerable people. But when he was executed, I was sitting beside his wife, holding her hand. She fainted. On the other side of a small barrier, I heard the victim of the murder's family cheer and cheer. I wanted to weep. I, I realized as I saw that cleaned up death that looks like a medical procedure but is the killing of another human being on purpose. I watched that take place. Ma'am, just a second. Entertain a motion. Now you can go ahead. Pardon? Go ahead. Oh, I watched that take place and saw what pain that inflicted on the culture and on all of us. If you choose to continue the death penalty, I challenge you to visit death row. I challenge you to walk with the person you sent to death. And I challenge you to remember 
that you paid that terribly vulnerable person who actually put the IV in the man's arm and killed him. And he killed him on my behalf with the money that I had paid in taxes. I agree that some persons are too ill, too scarred, or too damaged to live freely. The culture needs to be protected from them. These persons need life imprisonment without parole. Please give this your careful thought and consideration. Retribution never heals. It only destroys. Any questions? Thank you, ma'am, for your testimony. <coughs> Next proponent. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Ronald Reagan. I'm a retired district judge from Sarpy County with over 32 years of active service. And I'm here today to express support for LB 268. I've also had given a handout of my testimony in case my throat isn't able to carry through these two pages, but I'll do my best. I, several years ago, I spoke in favor of a bill that abolished the death penalty, and I appear once more because I have a unique perspective of this particular issue. In my time on the bench, I served as a member of many three-judge sentencing panels determining whether a sentence of death was an appropriate punishment. I served as a presiding judge of a three-judge panel that sentenced John Jubert, a serial child murderer, to death, a sentence which has been carried out. It may surprise you someone with such a background would be here opposing the death penalty. Judicial ethics prevented me from publicly expressing my views while on the bench. My oath required me to follow the law, and so I did. Yet during my time on the bench, I frequently spoke with other judges who were good friends of mine, some of whom still serve on the bench, but many of whom are retired, and we all agreed with a hope that sometime the legislature would simply abolish the death penalty. Many of us with the most intimate knowledge of the system are prevented or choose not to from sharing our suggestion or opinion as to why the death penalty doesn't work. When I say it doesn't work, I refer to a mistaken notion the death penalty provision has some general deterrent effect. I understand it as a specific deterrent, although no more so, no more so than a sentence of life without parole. But on a general deterrent basis, it has no effect whatsoever. The vast majority of criminologists have come to the same conclusion, but I have the specific case that makes the point. I mentioned John Jubert earlier. He was an extremely intelligent man over an IQ of 140, but a troubled mind lacking emotion. His first Nebraska victim, Danny Eberly, was kidnapped near downtown Bellevue transported nearly five miles to the south of town where he was murdered. Iowa, a state without the death penalty, was less than two miles east of the kidnapping site. It wasn't ignorance or stupidity that kept Juba from taking his victim across the river. The legal consequences of his action simply play no part in his decision, nor does it in any other murders. The general principle is affirmed by studies that show that bordering states one without a death penalty and one with, have no higher murder rates in the non-death penalty state. The principle is in effect regionally as well. The death penalty is now used almost exclusively in southern states. If capital punishment was a general deterrent, the per capita murder rate in those states should be lower. Yet the reverse is true. We can repeal the death penalty and there will be no detrimental harm to public safety. Given the time and resources attendant to capital cases from the police, prosecutors, and the court system, life without parole is the most efficient and effective penalty. I'd like to close with a comment intended to be neither critical nor self aggrandizing Putting aside for the moment the possibility of the state taking the life of someone actually innocent, I frequently hear an argument in support of the death penalty, the defendant, quote, deserved it for what he did. 
Retribution or revenge, although politically popular in polarizing cases, is simply neither a rational nor viable reason for the retention of the death penalty. I urge you to forward the bill for full consideration and I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Next proponent. Thomas P. Strigan, Sarpy County Public Defender, appearing on behalf of the Nebraska Criminal Defense Students Association. I'm just up here just to make sure we're on the record in support of this bill. That's all I have to say. Thank okay. you. Any questions? I guess not. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Next proponent. My name is Jeff Patterson, J-E-F-F-P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N. I'm a local attorney, and I represent four of the individuals known as the Beatrice Six. My clients are Joe White, Tom Winslow, Kathy Gonzalez, and Ada Joanne Taylor. I was asked to share with you uh, some of my observations on how the threat of the death penalty contributed to six people spending a total of 77 years in prison for crimes they did not commit. Three of the Beatrice Six had significant histories of psychosis, hysterical anxiety, and the inability to cope with stressful situations. Some were intellectually low functioning. They were all unsophisticated in the criminal justice system. They were all financially indigent. When they were arrested, they were subjected to repeated interrogations, some lasting as long as five hours, about a murder and a rape they knew nothing about. Their interrogators would tell them there was no doubt they were involved in Mrs. Wilson's murder, and unless they started cooperating, they will be convicted at trial and sentenced to die in the electric chair. The threat of being executed for a crime they had no memory of was terrifying. James Dean was so terrified that during the 22-day period between the day of his arrest and when he first started having dreams about Mrs. Wilson's murder, a police psychologist was called to the jail on at least four occasions to talk James down from hysterically screaming incoherently in his cell. My client, Joanne Taylor, was extraordinarily vulnerable. The county attorney and sheriff both knew that Joanne was a high risk for psychotic lapses when stressed, but that didn't particularly matter to them. While she was in county jail, the sheriff, his deputies, and the county attorney would frequently come back to the jail and tell Joanne if she didn't start cooperating, she would be the first woman to die in Nebraska's electric chair. The threat of execution was instrumental in Joanne later developing the psychotic delusion that she actually was the person who suffocated Mrs. Wilson. Joanne's lawyer at the time, her criminal defense lawyer, told me that he knew there were significant problems with the case against Joanne, but uh, when a plea deal was offered that took the death penalty off the table, it was just too risky to go to trial. Kathy Gonzalez knew she had nothing to do with Mrs. Wilson's murder. After she was arrested and held in jail, the sheriff frequently told Kathy that she was a damn liar and that if she didn't start cooperating, she'd be lucky if she made it to the electric chair given the number of death threats that they had received. Kathy pled no contest because she knew she was not guilty, but she also knew the evidence they were going to use to convict Joe White would likely convict her. She told me that her only goal was to not die in prison for a crime she did not commit. Tom Winslow also knew he was, guilt he was not guilty, but he knew that the same evidence that was actually, actually used to convict Joe White would convict him too, and he didn't want to die in prison. Like Kathy, Tom pled no contest, denying his guilt, but acknowledging that if he went to trial, he would be convicted. There was no doubt in Tom's mind that if he were convicted at trial, he would be sentenced to death. May I continue? Would you continue, please? Thank you. In the final analysis, the threat of execution was a significant factor in causing two of the Beatrice Six to start dreaming and having psychotic delusions that they were involved in Mrs. Wilson's murder. The threat of execution also caused two of the Beatrice Six to agree to no contest pleas to crimes they knew they didn't commit. The risk of trial was just too great, and they didn't want to die in prison for crimes they did not commit. The irony in this, though, is that although the county attorney sought to have Joe White sentenced to death, the trial judge sentenced Joe to life in prison because of all the favorable plea deals that the county attorney had made with the others. If someone from law enforcement were to tell you that the threat of the death penalty was a good thing because it encouraged pleas, they'd be only half right. For the Beatrice Six, it certainly encouraged pleas, but it encouraged innocent people to plead to crimes they didn't commit, and that is clearly not a good thing. 
The, the object lesson that we can take from the Beatrice Six case is that the threat of death penalty did not serve the interests of justice. It resulted in four people pleading guilty or no contest to crimes they knew nothing about, and the one person who could have been sentenced to death thankfully wasn't, because that's just how close we as Nebraskans came to having the blood of an innocent man on our hands. In the interest of justice, I ask you to support LB 268. Any questions? Thank you very much for your You're testimony. Welcome. Next proponent. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Molly, M-A-T-T-M-A-L-Y. I'm the coordinator for Nebraska Conservatives concerned about the death penalty. Uh, capital punishment is an extremely costly program for our state. This cost can be difficult to see since the death penalty is not listed as a line item in any particular department's budget, uh, but this is a burden on taxpayers nonetheless. The high cost is found in the initial trials, which take up considerably more of the court's time than non-capital cases, as well as the lengthy and necessary appeals processes, which can last for decades. Nebraska has carried out three executions since 1976, with, a mes with an estimated cost of $15 million each. This is not a program that's compatible with the principles of limited government or fiscal responsibility. I've submitted the written testimony on behalf of our national organization, Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty. Uh, this was written by Mark Hyden, our national advocacy coordinator, and gives a more detailed analysis of the high costs associated with the death penalty system. Further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. And your hand out. Next proponent. Good afternoon, Senator Seiler and members of the committee. My name is Greg Schleppenbach, S-C-H-L-E-P-P-E-N-B-A-C-H. I'm the executive director of the Nebraska Catholic Conference and testify on its behalf in support of LB 268. The teaching of the Catholic Church does not condemn use of the death penalty in principle. The death penalty is not regarded as intrinsically immoral. Recourse to it is not excluded from the right and duty the state has to defend society from unjust aggressors. Nevertheless, Catholic teaching also applies an extremely important condition to use of the death penalty, namely if non-lethal means are sufficient to defend the innocent and preserve public order and safety, then public authority must limit itself to such means as they are more in keeping with the common good and in more in conformity with the inherent dignity of each human being. In practical application, this teaching regarding the death penalty has become clearer and more relevant during the past quarter century. In his uh, encyclical, The Gospel of Life, the late Pope and now Saint John Paul II, in 1995, articulated a standard for application of this teaching. This standard provides a sound and justified public policy test for the death penalty. The test is this. Is the death penalty, given its ultimate consequence and finality, absolutely necessary? That is, are there absolutely no other means by which to defend society from an unjust aggressor? In analyzing these questions, St. John Paul himself responded from a global perspective that the cases of absolute necessity are extremely rare, if not practically non-existent. The Nebraska Catholic Conference urges you as legislators to consider LB 268 within this framework. We think the correct and proper response to the test of whether the death penalty is absolutely necessary is unambiguously no. The death penalty fails the test because in this modern and technological, technologically sophisticated age, means of punishment and protection other than the death penalty are available and adequate. The conditions necessary to justify using the means of last resort do not exist. What's more, in this culture, which too frequently resorts to death and violence as a response to social problems, Using the death penalty when there is no absolute necessity of doing so diminishes society even more and contributes to the growing disrespect for the dignity and value of every human life. We understand and respect the fact that many people have legitimate concerns and fears about the frequency of violence and heinous crimes in their communities. Legislators and society as a whole need to do all that can be done to deter and to respond conscientiously to this violence that undermines a stable society. 
Moreover, the needs of victims and their loved ones must be addressed. Nonetheless, much of the support for capital punishment, we believe, stems from a desire for revenge or from a desperate attempt to balance the terrible damage wrought by capital crime. And such feelings are understandable in the face of, a, of brutal and senseless violence inflicted upon innocent people. Just rest retribution is a legitimate desire. Nonetheless, it cannot be truly achieved under the veil of vengeance and its own form of violence. We urge a response that meets evil with justice worthy of our best nature as human beings, enlightened by faith in the possibility of redemption and forgiveness. The Nebraska Catholic Conference urges the committee to advance LB 268 to general file. Thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Next proponent. <clears throat> Good afternoon, members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Bill Thornton, B-I-L-L-T-H-O-R-N-T-O-N. I'm here to testify in favor of LB 268 to replace the death penalty with life without parole. Uh, for 30 years, I was a pastor here in Lincoln at Capital City Christian Church. I'm now in my third year as a professor at Nebraska Christian College, which is located in Papillion. In recent years, fundamentalists and evangelical branches of our Christian faith have begun questioning the death penalty system in the United States, recognizing that our capital punishment system is out of sync with biblical mandates and Christian values. While many evangelicals continue to acknowledge that the death penalty was called for in the Bible in certain cases, the death penalty as it's constructed in the Bible is very different than the system that is used here in our United States. Evangelicals are also becoming increasingly aware of the massive injustices carried out in the death penalty system. Throughout the Old Testament scriptures you find various laws that God established to ensure that the poor would not be unjustly treated in courts, that innocents would never be executed, and that there would be fair application of the death penalty. Uh, Exodus 23, 6 and 7 absolutely forbids the execution of an innocent person. These safeguards and standards rendered the death penalty almost obsolete in Bible times. The death penalty in the United States has almost none of these safeguards. For example, according to biblical rules, in order for the death penalty to be applied, there had to be at least two unrelated witnesses to the crime. However, in the United States, we can put people on death row with one jailhouse snitch who says the defendant confessed the crime to them. I won't belabor the committee with uh, countless injustices carried out in the death penalty system, as you have already heard from a number of other testifiers regarding this. I will just say that God has made it clear in Micah 6, verse 8, that we are to act justly to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Finally, I would just say that if we as followers of Christ believe that Christ died for all and no person is beyond redemption, then we should never advocate cutting someone's life short and therefore guaranteeing no chance at all for their ultimate redemption. Thank you. I'm willing to take any questions you may have. Seeing none, thank you for thank your you. testimony. Next proponent. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. My name is Fran K, F R A N K A Y E. Back in 1982, when some of my friends organized a group called Nebraskans Against the Death Penalty, I signed up. I saw, thought then it would be an easy fight. Unlike knotty questions like the nature of evil and the causes of child poverty, this problem could be solved by passing one simple law, such as LB 268. The arguments against capital punishment seemed clear. After all, no human system is infallible, 
so the death penalty requires that innocent people be executed. The death penalty has been imposed in a racially skewed way that is clearly unfair. Violence perpetuates violence. The death penalty does not deter others from committing murders. Looking at Nebraska and its contiguous states, Iowa has never had a death penalty and it has the lowest murder rate. Missouri has the most executions and it has the highest murder rate. No other Western democracy has a death penalty for ordinary crimes and no other Western democracy has a murder rate as high as that in the US. The prison system is perfectly capable of holding dangerous persons forever and rendering them helpless to hurt the public. There is absolutely no rational reason to have a death penalty. 33 years later, I have been to countless death penalty hearings by the Judiciary Committee, floor debates of the whole unicameral, vigils and teach-ins opposing the death penalty, and I have judged student essay contests arguing against capital punishment and written letters and articles explaining in excruciating detail why we only damage our society as a whole by retaining what my beloved NAACP friend Leola Bullock always called legalized lynchings. I have read scholarly articles purporting to show that executions really do deter murders, and I have read even more scholarly articles pointing out why the methodologies of the first set are incorrect and the conclusions simply wrong. I was mistaken about how quickly we could get rid of death sentences in Nebraska, but I was absolutely right in why we should do so. I remember a former senator stating, quite seriously, that studies have shown there is no deterrent effect to the death penalty, but I believe in deterrence. We really can't afford that kind of reason. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you. Next proponent. Good afternoon, Chairman Taylor. My name is John Krejci, um, K-R-E-J-C-I. Um, I'm a uh, retired professor of sociology, social work, anthropology from Nebraska Wesleyan. Um, I'll be very brief. The fact of the matter is, Nebraska really doesn't have a functioning death penalty. And this law, if it were passed, would make the, that a reality. Lawyers would say we have a de jure death penalty, but we don't have a de facto death penalty. There's no way to carry it out. So to be honest, let's just get rid of it. Uh, Carrie Dean Moore has been on the death row for 35 years. That, that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, the national trend is against the death penalty. It's not a tsunami, but it's like that quiet voice that's moving, moving, more states are eliminating it. Let's, let's get on the side of history. Uh, we know about it's not a deterrent, it costs a lot of money. Um, we, there's been a lot of unjust convictions that uh, we found out more recently, lengthy appeals. Uh, I've passed out a stays of execution, there's something like 50 of them on the thing that I've passed out. In other words, the, the trend is, you know, the only one, I mean, it, it's helpful for the defendants to have states of execution. It costs a lot of money to the state and to the courts. The only people who are making money on it is the lawyers. No offense to the committee. Um, I don't know when Senator Chambers introduced the first bill. I. Uh, but I know that uh, Charlie, Governor Charlie Thelwood repealed it in 1973. That was before Senator Borland was, uh, was Borfield was born. Um, so if, if Senator Chambers and I meet our demise, it, you'll, you need to carry this on. Um, I've got three volumes of the Baldus study done in 2001. Um, he concluded that if you kill a rich person, you're more likely to get the death penalty. Senator Chambers went round and round with him um, in, in the hearing because he tried to say that the death penalty wasn't disadvantageous to minorities and Senator Chambers, of course, um, said he, he wouldn't give in though. Um, however, in the last 20 years, we've executed three people, two of them were African-American or black. 
Um, I also included, this is a little off the topic, but a letter that I just received from Mando Wilanga, uh, David Rice, who would have been executed probably had he not come in that, in that uh, uh, gap, you know. He has been in prison for 40 some years. He really knows the system and he says, I like to meet, and some of the prisoner inmates would like to meet with the uh, Judiciary Committee members and talk about situation in the uh, penitentiary. And he's very wise. Um, uh, Harold Clark, director two times ago, used to meet with him and ask him for advice. So he knows, they, and he's a smart, smart guy. He's uh, really in very poor health because of COPD. Anyway, it's time to put Nebraska on the right side of history and uh, repeal the death penalty. Thank you. Any test questions for this testimony? Thank you. Thank you. Proponent. Chairman Senator Seiler <coughs> and remaining senators on the Judiciary Committee. I'm Alan Peterson, A L A N P E T E R S O N. <coughs> Excuse me. I am an attorney and a death penalty attorney for almost 30 years on the defense side, not the prosecution side. And I am the lobbyist for ACLU of Nebraska. I come here today, first of all, as I usually try to do, with some information you didn't already have. <clears throat> the assistants are handing out, first of all, a letter from Captain Jim David Saber, a, a former captain, high-ranking officer in the Lincoln Police Department for many years. And Captain David Saber was not able to stay and therefore asked if we would hand out his written testimony. So I ask that you consider that. He has strong and very well articulated views on the futility and worthlessness of the death penalty. Secondly, I have asked also to have the pages hand out, three pages, which is an exhibit I prepared. The top page of it shows where we are in the world, what countries have retained the use of the death penalty. And I handed that out so that you can see the list of those countries, and you'll find ours, unfortunately, on the list as the only Western democracy that has retained the use of the death penalty. There's another major democracy, Japan, but look at the rest of the list. That's our company. The second page of that exhibit has the list of the states in this country that really are still using the death penalty. And now that there are some new moratoriums on the death penalty and some more states that have abandoned it, the majority now of this country has gotten rid of it, at least in effect, in de facto form. The majority of our country's states have gotten rid of it. I prepared a list of seven reasons. You've heard them today, most of them at least, why we should get rid of it. And I'm not going to have much time, but I would like to go through the seven as quickly as I can. Seven strong reasons to pass 268. Number one, no deterrent effect. Remember, you've got to compare people with a death sentence as to whether that deterred them. We know it didn't. Uh, I would continue with my seven if I could, but I'll keep Please, it short. Yes. Please do. Thank you, Senator Seiler. You, you have to think, in the mind of the murderer, would they have killed if they thought they were going to spend the rest of their life in prison without parole? as opposed to would they kill if they thought they were going to get the death penalty. 
It's that marginal difference you have to look at. It's ridiculous to think that that would make a difference to them. Judge Reagan beautifully illustrated the point that, that Jubert could have gone a couple miles across the river and gone to a state with no death penalty. No deterrent effect, that's number one. It's established, it's proved. Secondly, there is a racial disparity in the application, especially with regard to the race of the victim, which has this country, in effect, devaluing persons of a minority race by having fewer of their murderers given the death penalty. Extensive studies have shown that, and it's not a fluke. Uh, we shouldn't have a law that permits such a thing. Third, the cost and delay. I've been representing Kerry Dean Moore since 1988. That's 27, 28 years. Uh, most of my work was not billed, but when I was in federal court, you could bill a certain amount of it. Uh, attorneys don't make a fortune off it, despite the remark we heard earlier. But the prosecutors are tied up, the courts are tied up, the witnesses are tied up, and uh, the cost and delay frustrates everybody from this body, I'm sure, to the rest of the legislature and the attorneys too. It's not worth it. What do you, what's the cost benefit? Fourth, the faulty methods of execution have resulted in torture of people being executed. The Eighth Amendment doesn't permit unnecessary pain to be intentionally inflicted or inflicted with deliberate indifference. That's what the Eighth Amendment, which brings the ACLU into this, says. And Nebraska doesn't even have a method now. And when they do get one, they'll have to do new Administrative Procedure Act rules to use it. And there'll be more litigation over that, I guarantee it. I might mention, and I'm not a criminal defense attorney, but I was appointed to represent a death row person, Mr. Moore, and there have been 19 separate proceedings, appeals, some of them by the state when they lost, some of them by Mr. Moore when he lost, 19. Each of them takes hundreds of hours of preparation and anguish on both sides, frankly, as to who, whoever wins or loses. That's fourth. Fifth, the fear of a mistaken execution, killing an innocent person. It's happened in this country, maybe once in Nebraska. Get rid of the death penalty. Then the mistakes, if there are some, like in Beatrice, at least can be repaired by paying big damages and so forth and letting the person out. Sixth, the moral and religious doubts about whether people should kill people to teach people not to kill people. That's nothing but a quip, I guess, but it's exactly what the death penalty apparently tries to do, to teach us not to kill people by killing people. And finally, the recognition that the loss of freedom, which many people think is the greatest value we have in our country, the total loss of freedom is not enough. Well, nowadays people recognize that it is. And those reasons are why the death penalty's use is diminishing yearly, and in the United States and in the world. And the United States does not to stay, need to stay in the bad company of those nations that keep it. And so, how about passing LB 268 and strongly supporting the repeal of the death penalty by the legislature, and we would hope the governor would sign that too. Thank you very much, and thanks for the extra time. I appreciate Any it. Any further questions? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further proponents? Any opponent? <clears throat> Pardon me, Mr. Chairman, I was a little late getting up, but I stand in support of LB 268. My name is Lauren Schmidt, L O R A. Wait just a second, Lauren. Are you opponent or proponent? I'm a supporter of LB 268. Okay. Yes. 
My name is Lauren Schmidt, L-O-R-A-N-S-C-H-M-I-T. I speak here today as a longtime supporter of the death penalty and since 1979 an opponent of the death penalty. I've spoken here many times before. I want to reemphasize my opposition is based upon the great disparity that exists between those who are sentenced to death and those who are not. Senator Chambers has, has outlined 23 executions since 1903 of the thousands of murders that have been co concluded in this state. Those are pretty good odds for any kind of a gambler, and I therefore believe that the deterrent factor is non-effective. Uh, My own situation is a little different. I have a neighbor who has a nephew who was 16 years old when he was involved in a murder. His accomplice was 17. Although the accomplice hung the bar that eventually rendered the gentleman unconscious who later, later died, they were, in my opinion, equally culpable. The unfortunate fact for my neighbor's nephew was that he had no money. He had a court-appointed attorney. The deputy prosecutor offered the attorney the option of speaking, of uh, accepting a, I believe, involuntary manslaughter plea. The inexperienced attorney turned it down. The accomplice of my friend's nephew had an, a skilled attorney. He turned the state's evidence, testified against my neighbor's nephew. He was sentenced to six years in Kearney. My neighbor's nephew was sentenced to life without parole. Judge Buckley at the sentencing said that the only mitigating factor against the death penalty was his extreme youth, 16 years of age. My neighbor's nephew is still in prison. I have appeared before the Board of Pardons several times asking that his sentence be committed. Not successful. It's amazing to me that one person can get by with a six-month sentence at Kearney and their life without parole and probably narrowly escaped being sent to the death row. That kind of disparity to me encourages disrespect for the law. The information recited here by the gentleman about the Beatrice Six befuddles my mind. I am a strong supporter of law enforcement. I only hold repugnance for law enforcement officials who use the tactics that were described with the Beatrice Six. Uh, time is up, Senator. I'll uh, be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much, Senator. Any further proponents in favor of this bill? Opponents. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, my name is Don Klein, K-L-E-I-N-E. -E. I'm a Douglas County attorney, and I'm here on behalf of the Nebraska County Attorney Association to oppose LB-268. Uh, in certain extreme, unique situations, we believe that there needs to be uh, the death penalty. Uh, I can state in my history as a prosecutor, I prosecuted probably as many first-degree murder cases as anybody ever has, and I have two people that are had sentenced to the death penalty, Arthur Lee Gales and Roy Ellis. They were both, the victims on those cases were young African American children. Uh, they were raped and murdered Latara and Tamara Chandler uh, by Arthur Lee Gales after he left their mother uh, for, he thought she was dead. At 11th and Gray Streets, he went back to an apartment and raped uh, Latara and strangled her. And then when her brother woke up, he went in and, and killed his the seven year old. Uh, Roy Ellis killed uh, after he raped Amber Harris, 12-year-old, and buried her in Hummel Park. Both had a history of, uh, of violent behavior and a history of, of, of prior sexual assaults by Roy Ellis. Uh, the purpose, I think, is, is, again, I don't disagree with a lot of the testimony today that I think it's uh, something that should be only used in extreme circumstances. Uh, I, I see that particularly in Nebraska uh, as compared to other states that have the death penalty. 
Uh, it's meted out, I think, in the, as a fair process as it possibly can be. You know, as things have changed over the course of time, uh, the county attorney now makes a determination of aggravating circumstances exist. If those aggravators exist, they're put up there by statute by the, this legislative body, uh, the people, uh, and we determine if we can prove those aggravators, we file that, the jury determines if those <coughs> aggravators exist, then a three-judge panel is appointed to uh, weigh the aggravators versus the mitigating circumstances that can be put on by the defense. The three-judge panel then makes the decision as to the penalty, and if one judge uh, votes against the death penalty, then there's no death penalty. <coughs> I think the process is as, as, as set out is, is, is a good process as far as the process can be. Uh, I do have reservations. Uh, you know, I, I, I go before juries right now, and I go before three judge panels on cases, and de facto, we don't, as, as John Krejci said, we don't have a death penalty here because the state can't figure out uh, a process. Uh, and I think that's, you know, you have a death penalty. The, the, the legislature has, has, has a death penalty uh, on board, and the state can't figure out how that system uh, they can't get a process. So, I mean, that's a problem from the state's perspective, not ours, but I do question sometimes that here I am in the trenches uh, filing cases with aggravating circumstances, asking a jury to make that determination in a three-judge panel when the state can't get its act together as far as the penalty itself, the penalty goes. <coughs> I see my time is up, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Senator Sitting of old times, do you have more you'd like to say for the record? You know, not really, Senator. You know, we, we, we've talked about this before, uh, and, 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 and my views are my perspective, uh, so I don't have really anything else to add. But if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Seed done. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Any further opponent? Anybody in the neutral? Senator Chambers, you may close. I will uh, have the written documents that were submitted received as part of the transcript. There were a numerous, numerous signers on the outer side that uh, favored the bill. Their names will be put into the record. Senator Chambers, you may close. Thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'll be very brief. Not only was the situation in Beatrice bad, where six people were pressured into confessing to murders, that a murder they had nothing whatsoever to do with due to the threat of the death penalty, in Douglas County, there was a sheriff's forensic investigator named David Cofold. K-O-F-O-E-D, who actually planted blood evidence and obtained two convictions. And what helped, though one of those young men was, he had a mental problem. There was extensive interrogation. Two young people from the eastern part of the country tried to pawn a ring, something involving a ring that had come from one of the victims that these two young people had, so they were to establish conclusively that these two people committed the murders. The two young men who confessed nothing whatsoever to do with those murders. So the state of Nebraska has made errors. The name of the man who was deemed to have been executed in Nebraska, who was innocent, his last name was Shumway. And former Governor Robert Carey was given enough evidence to be convinced of the man's innocence that posthumously he pardoned this man whom Nebraska had executed. Based on what I had read about the case, there was never a body found, but this individual had gone hunting or camping and some of his clothing was found in a stream. And on the basis of that, it was determined by those who make such determinations that he had been murdered. 
Shumway, for some reason, was connected with it. He was executed. And if I'm not confusing that case with another one, I think they had to call out the National Guard or some people from the Army to carry out the execution. In a country like this or any place, the killing of one innocent person by the state should be enough to forsake a system that could do such a thing. Nebraska is last in some areas for the wrong reason. It was the last state to have the electric chair as the only means of execution. And that was my doing. For over a decade, I stopped Nebraska from enacting a lethal inje injection law. And I told them, as I always do, that my intent was to make sure that Nebraska would continue to have an electric chair and be the only state that had one. And people ask if I was so much opposed to the death penalty, and I thought death by electrocution and a judicial execution was so horrible, why would I want to maintain that method of execution? And I pointed out that being realistic with the studying that I had done of this penalty, I had actually gotten the case histories of people who were executed. They had them in little folders, and I got them from the Historical Society, and I read the documents. I knew, as sure as I knew that Boris Karloff played the role of Frankenstein, that nobody would be electrocuted before the chair would be struck down in Nebraska, and that is what happened. Nebraska is the last state to deny driver's licenses to these young people known as the dreamers. That is not anything to be proud of, but that's one of Nebraska's trophies. Georgia, two days ago, was going to execute the first woman in 70 years, but they had to cancel it because when they were going through a run through, as they called it, the chemicals were cloudy. And they felt that in order to avoid the fiascos that had happened in other states with a botched execution, they wouldn't try to carry it out. I don't remember if it's Georgia, Alabama, Oklahoma, or one of those states, but to show how bizarre things have become, this particular state, and I have the article, which I will show by the time we get to the discussion on the floor, they're talking about experimenting with nitrogen. Now, to take a life, maybe they'll next say, try antifreeze. <laughs> I think that the Supreme Court may be on the verge of not allowing executions because of the horrendous, bizarre, grotesque, occurrences during these executions. The governor of Pennsylvania has called off all executions. I didn't ask Mr. Klein any questions because today, in my mind, is one of those days not to try to ask a gotcha question or to bring up cases which were more horrible than those where the death penalty was sought, yet no death penalty was sought. Everybody knows that things like that happen. Don Klein was serving as the prosecutor in Douglas County when a man named Clarence Victor, who was <coughs> mentally challenged, had been sentenced to death and a law that I had a hand in getting enacted before the US Supreme Court took action that said people who are, it was, the term was mentally retarded then, could not be executed. And he fit that definition. And Don Klein, the prosecutor, Michael Coffey, the judge against whom I filed complaints, would not 
tried to have him executed anyway. Don Stenberg was the Attorney General, and when this happened, he was very upset, and he wanted to challenge the constitutionality of the law. The Supreme Court said what every first-year student in law school knows, an appellate court can only examine issues that were raised and decided by a lower court. The constitutionality had not been raised, so it could not be raised on appeal, so he ignominiously lost that case as he had others. When you can see a situation like the one I touched on where the Attorney General's office deliberately and knowingly withheld information from the Nebraska Supreme Court, made the court believe that everything was in order to carry out the execution of Kerry Dean Moore and all that was needed was a death warrant and the Supreme Court issued the warrant. Then it became clear that the state could not carry out the execution. The Attorney General's office knew that they couldn't carry it out. And when their hand was called, I had written a piece that the World Herald printed. The assistant of the Attorney General said, well, they didn't think there was anything to reveal to the court because although they didn't have the drugs, they thought that there's some way they'd have them by the time the death warrant date came around and that the execution could be carried out. When you can deal with the state taking a life in such a slapdash, casual, careless, deceptive manner, the shame that it brought to the state should be sufficient. Since 1997, there's been no execution. And with some of the men who were executed, they wanted me to spend time with them. They knew I would not witness the execution. When John Jubert was going to be executed, he was very small. He had grown a beard and long hair. And while I was with him, I'll tell you why I went. There was a sheriff named Pat Thomas from Sarpy County, and he had asked Director Clark, could he be an observer? Not a witness to the execution, but what Mr. Clark had implemented was a program whereby certain officials could come out and watch the preparations during the days immediately preceding an execution to see how the person was treated. The first person who went to do such a thing was an auditor, his name was John Breslow, and he watched, and guess what he commented on? How good the food was that was served. That was the most important thing to him. Well, Sheriff Thomas wanted to be such an observer, and Mr. Clark could not turn him away, but he called me, and he said, Senator, I know how you feel about the death penalty, and that's why I'm gonna ask you to do something. And I said, what is that? And he explained about the sheriff coming and how he had reason to believe that there would be some taunting and other inappropriate conduct by the sheriff toward John Juber. So Mr. Clark felt that I would be a foil to the sheriff if I agreed. And I said, I don't want my presence to be misconstrued as being in favor of this death penalty, and I'm only coming because I want the man's humanity, even though he's sentenced to die, to be acknowledged. When Sheriff Thomas found out I was coming, he canceled out. But because I had said that I would be there, I spent a lot of time with John Jubert during his last few days. Judge Reagan, in a discussion with me just the other day, said he has had many second thoughts about having agreed to sentence Jubert to die. There are articles now appearing talking about executioners who committed suicide, guards who are talking about 
post-traumatic stress disorder because they were forced to participate in executions and to keep their job, they had to do it. But now that they're no longer worried about their job, they're worried about their sanity. When I was there with Jubert, they would not open the blinds. He was in what they call the hospital room. And I asked why. They said, well, when Willie Ote was executed, and I spent time with him, he asked me to. I won't witness an execution. They said that they were executed at night. When night fell, Willie Ote stood near a window, and the crowd could see him. And the ones who wanted to see the execution broke out into a frenzy. The profanity, the screaming, the racial slurs, the cursing. So because of that, and it was written about days after that, the shame that was brought to Nebraska because of the way those people behaved. I said, it's daytime. There are no crowds out there. This man, in a few hours, will never see another sunrise, never see a sunset. I want those blinds opened. And if you don't open them, I will open them myself. And I'd like to see somebody working for the Department of Corrections stop me. And the only way he or she will stop me is to put hands on me. And if that's done, you ought to call the sheriff because you're going to have to put me in jail. So they said, well, Senator, I guess it won't hurt. So they opened the blinds. When time came for them to prepare him, that's what they call it, he wanted his spiritual advisor to walk with him from his cell to where they were going to kill him. And the deputy warden would not allow it. And so I called Harold Clark. And I said, there's no reason not to let this man have his spiritual advisor walk with him. And before I could give an argument, Clark countermanded that order and said the spiritual advisor could be there. So I sat with Jubert as they prepared him. When they cut off all of his hair, and he was young, he looked like a juvenile. When they shaved him, his face was babyish. And I'm not saying these things to indicate that I approve of what he did. That has nothing to do with it. I'm telling you what I saw with my own eyes. He was <coughs> shorter than I am. So when the deputy sheriff, deputy warden, was trying to cut his hair, Jubert said, uh, Senator Chambers used to be a barber, so do you mind letting him cut my hair? Because that blade is kind of pulling. And so I told the, I said, I told the guy, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll cut his hair. And the deputy warden was shaking visibly. He said, well, I, I can't let you do that because this is a process and a procedure where only state employees of the corrections department can do it, but I'll be careful. So he took this blade and he cut his hair very short. Then he had to shave him. So he got this water in a container. It was a highly polished aluminum or metal container that was shaped like a kidney bean. And I said, is the water warm? He said, well, no. I said, well, if you're going to shave somebody, even though you're going to use that shaving cream, it would help if you would warm a towel, put it on his head, it will soften the hair. Then you put this shaving cream on and you can shave more smoothly. And he said, well, thank you, and he did that. And as he made the first pull, it was a safety razor. Then he put the blade in the water, because I told him after you make the stroke, rinse the blade so that it will, I was gonna make it as clinical as they were making it. But you know who suffered the most through that? Not I, who was watching something that was grotesque and that I disagreed with. Not the man who's being prepared to die, but this employee who had to pre prepare him for the killing. He finally got through with that. Then he said, uh, he called him Mr. He said, Mr. Jubert, I have to, I have to shave the hair off the side of your leg. <clears throat> 
so Jubert made his leg available and they cut the pant leg and he went through the process again of trying to shave and this time he nicked him and he said, oh, he's bleeding. And Jubert said, with what you're going to do to me in a few minutes, does that nick really make any difference? But the man had to try to do it right, so he asked me, as a barber, what would you do if you nicked somebody? I said, do you see that stick right there? It looked like a crayon. I said, that's styptic. It will stop bleeding when you have a small cut like that. So dip it in the water, then put it on the nick and roll it around. It'll stop the bleeding. That's how grotesque this was, and it did stop the bleeding. When finally, the last few people who wanted to talk to Jubert were there, I told him, I won't be in that room with you. This is between you and whatever you have to say to those people. But then when they were going to escort him to the electric chair, he was in what looked like a box, huge guards. You couldn't even see Jubert. There were two in the front, two on each side, and then two in the back, and then one right behind Jubert. Jubert had a thick leather strap around his waist and all these chains. And this guy had to hold that strap. And I didn't think, I just looked at him. And then he dropped his head. None of them would look at me. So we got on the elevator. And when we went down to the floor where the electric chair was, when you got off the elevator, if this table were the layout, the elevator came down here. There was a room to the right of the elevator when you got off, and then there was the gurney. And I told Harold Clark, not where Juba could hear it, that was the most vicious, cruel thing they could do, was leave that gurney in the eyesight of the man they were about to kill. So when they started, strapping him in a chair, his feet wouldn't reach the floor. He was small. So he, they had to lift him up on this chair. And they began to tighten these straps. And he was so small that the guy who was each man had a strap, one strap around one wrist, another to strap the other one, then somebody was going to put one around his chest, then his leg. They had more people in there than they needed, but I guess they needed them. So when he started to have his hand, his wrist strapped, John Jubert told him, he said, my arm has to be held stable and it's not. It's not tight enough. It, it'll move. So then the guy, <coughs> he panicked, he took the strap and put his knee on the side of the chair and pulled as hard as he could. And you could see the veins blue pop up in Jubert's hand. And then you could see all of his, his wrist and his hand below that strap turn blue. That's what they did to the other one. Then I watched while this other guy, he was a deputy warden too, he took these sponges and he dipped them in water and he put them, put it on Juber's head. And you have to have a way to make sure the circuit is closed so that the electricity will go through. Then he had trouble attaching this, it's like a, small saucer except it's made out of metal and it had a wing nut. He had trouble tightening it. Everything they did, they had a problem doing it because Jubert was so small. They finally got it done and I told him, I said, I gotta go now. And he just looked at me so, I don't have a heart, so don't, don't get me wrong. But even without a heart, 
when you see somebody about to be killed by the state, then other things go out the window. They were going to get what they wanted. So I just put my hand on his hand, and then he dropped his eyes, and I left. But before we started that walk that he had to take from that whole trip, that hospital room, we had a little conversation. And I'll never tell anybody what he said to me, but what I told him, the reason that I'm here is to make sure that they don't do anything except take your life. And that's what they're going to do. You can't stop them. I can't stop them. So don't let them do anything else to you. If you have any feeling of dignity, you keep that. And whatever you do, don't break down. Don't let them see that. And why did I say that? Because this is not being melodramatic. His eyes teared up, but only one tear came down his cheek. And that was all. And then they killed him. I spent time with Robert Williams the same way. And when he got in the chair, they had his arm so that the crazy bone in your elbow was against the chair. And he told them that the pain, they wouldn't do anything about it. I said, hey, man, stop. Stop what you're doing. And I told the man who was in the execution chamber just standing there, deputy, I said, go get Harold Clark, the director. He had to be there. So he called me. I said, Ernie, Ernie, what's the matter? And I told him. So he told them, don't let me hear of anything like that happening again. You're not going to do anything like that. So after they had him strapped in, I was leaving. And I could hear him, Robert Williams, not asking for mercy. He called the name of the husband of one of the women he killed and apologized. And he said, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry for what I did. And I don't know how people felt about it, but he made some comment about he'd have the chance pretty soon to apologize to the man's wife. Those are the things people ought to see when they watch how these executions occur. It's not where they, you walk in and everything is done in an efficient way. People are nervous. They haven't done this before. And I'm sure every one of those people who participated had problems afterward, because I watched them. And they wouldn't make eye contact with me. They were shaking. So in order to kill one man, you created eight killers. And every one of them played a guilty role. Not the attorney general, who boasts about having an execution. Not the governor. Not the legislators. Nobody. They wouldn't want to be there. They wouldn't want to see it. But that's what's done. And even before I saw all that, I made up my mind. When I first came down here, I was going to do everything I could to stop the state from killing people. So I started offering bills to abolish the death penalty. In 1979, the legislature passed a bill to abolish the death penalty. Then Governor Thone vetoed it, even though his wife was against the death penalty. And some of the senators wanted me to try to override. I said, no. I won't do it. I watched these senators casting those votes, and I saw how hard it was for them to cast that vote. And I won't put them through it again because we don't have 30. Even if we got 27, 28, or 29, we'll not get 30, and I will not make a motion to override. There comes a point when all things are at an end. And that was the end, as far as I was concerned that year. This bill may not pass. But as long as I'm in this legislature, I'm going to try to save this state from itself. I'm going to try to get rid of the barbarity that I witnessed. And I'm going to try to make it impossible for any employees to carry out an act that those who insist on it being carried out would not even be there to watch it. And if there's a shred of decency in us, no matter what anybody has done, 
we should insist that this state is not going to kill anybody else. I know they say Jesus had to die to save all of you all, but had I been a Roman senator, maybe I would have had the death penalty abolished and it would have had to be carried out a different way. But there's a man who was innocent, everybody says. He was executed. He went through a kangaroo court. And this one thing so people will understand how this system works. We are leaving in the bill the requirement that there be a three-judge sentencing panel, just as with the death penalty, because life without the possibility of parole, that, that is really a cruel sentence in my mind. But as long as somebody is alive, there's a possibility that something could happen where the state will recover its sanity and the killing will not occur. But at any rate, the three-judge panel will consist of the judge who presided over the trial, then the chief justice at random will pick two other active district judges, and the three of them will take, it'll be a hearing. The state will present what they call aggravating circumstances, or those things that will keep this particular killing from being what is called an ordinary murder. The US Supreme Court has said that an automatic or mandatory death penalty is unconstitutional because it does not allow for the taking into consideration of the particular circumstances of each individual. So each case has to be handled. And you have to have these aggravating circumstances. Then you had to have mitigating circumstances, which if they overweighed, overbalanced the aggravating, you couldn't carry out a death sentence. But anyway, the state presents its aggravators. Then the other side prevents, presents the mitigators. And the only way a death sentence can be carried out or be pronounced to be carried out is if the panel rules unanimously that there should be an execution. And two men were taken off death row because the sentencing panel was not unanimous. In the old days, when somebody was talking earlier, they mentioned that two unrelated witnesses had to bear witness to exactly the same thing. And what the rabbis insisted on was that they use the same words to describe the incident. And if, any, if either side, any, or however many witnesses, if there was a variation in how they described it, there could be no, no death carried out. People talk about the Jewish law, but they didn't even carry it out the way people who say they believe in that would do it. So what they would do, when they were taking a person to the place of execution, somebody would go before and call, is there anybody who can say anything on behalf of this man, anybody? And if anybody said, I can, they didn't check to see if this is credible. Everything was stopped right there. They didn't want to kill anybody. They didn't take your eye if you took somebody else's eye. They didn't break your tooth out if you broke somebody else's tooth. They didn't take a hand if you cut somebody's hand off. That was to be a measure of compensation or damage. You had to provide for that family something to be the equivalent to the extent that money could be an equivalent to the damage you did to that person. So I had indicated that I was gonna take some time to close and whoever had to leave could do so. But I wanted some of these things in the record so that if anybody in the future reviews these hearings, I want it clear why I will do all that I can to see that the death penalty is abolished. To my surprise, several senators have signed on to the bill. And all of them had been on one, one of those sheets. So naturally, I signed, yeah, bring them aboard. This is the love train. <laughs> <laughs> and we haven't left the station yet. So anybody who'd like to get on board, there's always room. Now, if there are any questions that you all have that you'd like to ask me, I will answer them. Otherwise, I've said all that I intend to say. Thank you. Look, we got, we got two. Senator Chambers, we got two questions. I have a question. Williams, Senator Williams. 
Thank you, Senator Seiler, and, and thank you, Senator Chambers, for your wisdom and foresight. I will ask this question on the record only, yes. and then if we could discuss this in executive session. I have a question on paragraph 7. It's page 2, line thir starting at line 30, on the intent of the law that I would like to have further discussion on that very limited piece of this bill, which I support. And we will discuss it, but I will say this for the record. You know when they talk about medicine, there are active ingredients, then there are others that are just, that just bulk it out. Those findings are not active ingredients. The actual law takes place after that. So I will not fall on my sword about any one or all of those. If the committee is of the feeling or the mind that we don't need to include the findings, you have no objection from me. Thank you. Senator, I believe we have a question over here. Yes, uh, Senator Chambers, thank you for your uh, wisdom and vision for decades and uh, always fighting for, for those who have no voice. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to ask you, just briefly, just bring up the fiscal note. To me, I, and I guess I'm still learning about how that all works, we are going to save money if we do not have the death penalty. Right. So I don't know why we can't look at the number of people that we have on death row, look at the number of, of appeals that are made, and, and talk about that within the note. Do you have anything to say about well, that? There was an attempt to have a study like that made, but the governor would not allow it. Because he knew what, the, what it would be. There have been studies after studies in states where they had the death penalty by scholars, by these people who can put all these graphs and charts together, and it always comes out invariably that to get somebody to the death house, let alone to execute them, it would cost more than what it would take to let that person live his or her natural life. It seems counterintuitive, but when you start looking at how quickly these legal bills mount, mount up, it's, it's very easy to establish that. But there are people who will not accept that fact that it costs more to execute somebody than to keep them locked up for life. But what I used to do was to keep articles every time there was a murder so that I could, when I presented the, the bill, show that there were very atrocious murders committed in the rural areas, but there was never a death sentence imposed, never a death penalty sought. And one of the prosecutors told me, he said, not only is it too expensive, the counties don't want us to do that. It costs too much. One county was going bankrupt because they sought a death penalty. Maybe it was down there where Rulo was, and the legislature actually appropriated some money to help them because in order to get a death sentence, they, went bank they were going bankrupt. And for those who don't know, the man who committed a heinous crime, and the lady was here mentioning how she has to constantly be reminded that man now has terminal brain cancer. So he's going to cheat the executioner of his prey. Why do we do that? It seems to me that as bad as human beings are, we should be better than that. But at any rate, you can maybe Google, I don't know what you'd look under, but that, that's the word I hear to find anything you want to <laughs> for the cost of carrying out, you know, to implement a death sentence. And that's why some of the conservatives are starting to speak against it, and even in Congress, because the money is so much, and they had no idea that it was really costing as much as it is. So some of them, I think, were having the examination made because they were sure that it wasn't going to be like that. Then when they saw how much it really was, they started saying, you need to get rid of it. And consider this, 72 people from the early 1900s in Nebraska were sentenced to die. 23 have been executed. Do you think those 23 were the worst people who ever committed murder in this state? And is the state better now because those 23 people are moldering in the grave? And do people even know the number? Do they know the names of these people? Do they even care? 
I think what we have as an obligation is the duty to raise the level of civilization in this state, even if we're criticized for it, and not one of you is going to lose your election because of your position on the death penalty. People know so little about it that one year when I was making the strongest push I had ever made, a woman wrote me a letter and said, Senator Chambers, I'm so glad you're there because you're the one pushing to reinstate the death penalty. <laughs> First of all, the death penalty was in place. But she didn't know that. And I was trying to get rid of it. <laughs> but that's how uninformed people are on it. But was that your? I, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to get that into the record because I just, it's so disappointing not to see. We've had over a century of death penalty cases. Surely we can look at the number of, of appeals and compare those to the people who have life sentences and look at that differential in I, court costs. Not to cut you off, I do know that Kansas did conduct such a, a study and it verified what everybody We're else had been saying. We're going to save millions. It's going to be good. We, we have to get these people fiscally behind this. It's like if right. they won't do it morally. Whatever it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else? Yeah, I, Thank I, I have one. Oh. Come next March, or come next Tuesday, I'm going to get a year closer to you. <laughs> you, you I didn't even understand you. You're going to get what? I'm going to get a year closer to oh. you. You okay. keep talking about being okay. the old man up there. You okay. better keep going because I'm closing in on you. Okay, Sonny, <laughs> but you'll never catch me. 